Hello everyone, my name is Anil and I'm PTL of OVSDB project and uh, I'll be today, you know, taking you through briefly about what we did in last two release, Beryllium and Boron and what we are, you know, planning for the, for the future carbon release. Uh, so I'll briefly go through the high level features of it. I won't be going deep down into it, but if you need more details, we'll provide you references where you can reach out to us, you know, to get more details about those things. So I'll go through a brief history of it and I'll talk about the uh, project overview, uh, OVSDB and a network is split. So most of you, if you are following the OVSDB project, you must be, you know, thinking about the network because network was also kind of a functionality of the OVSDB. Uh, but now in, in a Boron release, we kind of, you know, split it out and it's now its own new project. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think this is, this works better. So we talk about the existing functionalities, clustering support, reconciliation support, blueprint support and performance. So these are the features that we, you know, apart from the existing functionality, we added three, these, you know, four major functionalities in, in beryllium release and the boron release. We'll talk about, you know, briefly about the future direction, but we will be having a, you know, uh, another DDF session. We will be talking about more detail in the future direction part of it and some references to, you know, get, getting started with the OVSDB. So this project was proposed in hydrogen release by Kyle, Brent, and Madhu. And uh, scope for this project was initially to kind of support the, you know, OpenStack networking. So OpenStack neutron networking doing through ODL controller. So that was the initial scope and that required, uh, you know, a few components into it because uh, they wanted to do is using OVS and OpenFlow. So they implemented the, you know, a shim layer or, or a kind of a driver for OVSDB. Uh, and that was that was not a full intent to kind of support it like a full-fledged OVSDB plugin, but that was there because they needed it for the whole, you know, bigger solution there. And it was all initially based on the AD cell, that is the old cell model we had. Uh, and then we migrated the whole code to the MD cell in a lithium uh, plugin time base uh, in a and after that, we introduced the OVSDB hardware VTAP Southbound plugin. That is the main use case is still an OpenStack uh, L2 gateway, uh, you know, service provision. Uh, that's the reason we kind of introduced OVSDB hardware VTAP. Uh, and now the entire code base is based on MD cell because AD cell is deprecated out of the controller. Uh, and yeah, OVSDB and network split is something we're going to talk. So now after they split when the network functionality out of it, now the two major functionality that this project has is OVSDB Southbound plugin and hardware VTAP Southbound plugin. And they have a library that is basically encoding decoding library, uh, you know, that is used by both of these plugins. So you can go to the wiki page, we have a details there, we are putting more documentation there, so hopefully that will help. Uh, if you want to look at the code base, you can go to this GitHub or a Garrett, this link. It has a OESDB master branch or all the branches, all the codes are there. Uh, in Beryllium and Boron release, we had around 30, 72 contributors. And uh, and we, we had around 1,200 commits to both of these branches. So it was a significant contribution. If I see the, you know, the whole one year, we made a literally very significant progress in terms of whether we can, you know, with, with the confidence whether we can say that whether, you know, folks can use it in deployment or not. So we are in that stage where, you know, we stabilize it, it, it pretty well. Folks on a downstream project, they tested it and they gave a good number about it. Still there is a scope, but yeah, it's, it's pretty stable code base as of now and we kind of, you know, doing a lot of testing in upstream as well about this project. So contributors, if you look at it, there's a long list of contributors, and if you see, is one of the, you know, diversified project. We have a contribution from, you know, more than 10 companies here, and, and it's, it's not, in term of code contribution, in term of testing, in term of documentation, everything, you know, is, is, is widespread. So, uh, and then, you know, we are still looking for more contributors. So, you know, if you want to put your name here, please, you know, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and the consumer of this, so these consumers are, uh, you know, open daylight consumers. So if you look at uh, Network, GBP, SFC, VTN, NIC, FR, Genius, Uni Manager, they all use this Southward plugin. 
Uh, mostly they use the functionality of OVSDB southbound plugin, but in a network uh, we use hardware VTAP also for our L2 gateway use cases. And this is the big list of you know contributors, and you know uh, not all the folks are here, but the, these these are the folks who made a significant contribution in the beryl beryllium release and the boron release. And if you look at the you know companies, it's like Red Hat, IBM, Ericsson, Intel, Brocade, you know. 163.com, InnoCybe, so it's, it's you know you know the whole range of you know, all the most of the networking companies. If you see, you know they are kind of here, and and it's it's you know big applause to all the contributors here. You know, so did a tremendous job to kind of pull this off, and we are pretty happy about what we kind of you know pulled off in a Boron release, and we are we are proud to say that people can now literally use it. So. Now, OESDB and network split. So, what's the reason? So, if you look at that, you know, right hand side diagram, we have a two plugin southbound, OESDB southbound, that basically handle two schemas. We have an open flow plugin, and then we have a network. And this network project was basically consuming OVSDB southbound plugin. So it's like in, in ODL uh, terminology, we have a project in a specific tiers, right? The offset one project, offset two project, and offset zero project. So if you look at this diagram, it's like a network is one layer higher than OVSDB. So OVSDB is kind of lying into offset one, and network is in offset two. So offset two are generally dependent on offset one. But in this case, when you know in the in the perineum release, both of these projects were in the same you know project, and that was kind of overlapping scope there. So that's why, and, and the consumption model was like that, you know, network is just a consumer, it's not really a part of it. So it's totally a separate, you know, component here. So, and this was the one of the reasons. The other reason was the dependency between these projects. So there was a cyclic dependency that caused because networks were dependent by on OVSDB and SFC was also dependent on OVSDB and network was dependent on SFC. So there was a kind of cyclic dependency there. So it was creating some of the problems. So to better, you know, sort out the scope of the project and, you know, to kind of, uh, Position the project at the at the appropriate level. We kind of split it out, and we took out network. And network is now its own full-fledged, you know, networking project uh, under the Open Daylight umbrella. And OVSDB just contain the plugins part and the driver library. Let's see if I'm missing something. Okay, that's pretty much it here. Anybody has any question about the split part of it? Okay. No, it's offset one now. Yeah, offset one. Yeah. No, boron is offset two because that's where we did the split, so it was offset two. But in a beryllium, you know, in the carbon, when we in M zero, we we you know push it as a offset one project now. Yeah. So less time for us now. <laughs> okay. So existing features. So. It supports the two schemas, OVSDB and hardware VTAP, and uh, I don't want to list all the features here, but these are the Yang models. These are the APIs which these plugin expose, and you can use it to kind of configure your devices. So, you know, it has a, it, it, these are the only Yang model that expo these plugins expose. So you can go and whatever you can find out that functionality should be working. Okay, and you can outrightly use this model. So if you're looking for more details about the existing feature, please go and look out these Yang models. Uh, both the plugins are cluster aware, so you can deploy these plugins in the cluster environment. You can run a three node cluster and you know, uh, OVSDB will work for you. So that HA is already there. This is something we introduced in Beryllium. Uh, Boron, we did some uh, bug fixes and all that. In Carbon, we are you now planning to make it even more stable, uh, you know, because the new feature were introduced in a controller platform, so we are planning to kind of use those. Uh, library for encoding and decoding, this was, you know, it was there from Hydrogen. We tried to do some refactoring and um, some more improvement of the code base so that, you know, both the library can consume it and all that. So, yeah, so these were the existing feature. And what we did in Beryllium and Boron, so we improved connection handling. So we face a lot of problem, you know, we came out of Jenkins, we used Jenkins system and there was, you know, abrupt connection dropping, multiple devices connecting and connection flapping is happening and that was, that was creating a lot of problem. So we, 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 first thing we did is we try to improve that connection handling because that helps in a clustering environment also. Because if you are in a clustering environment and your connection are flapping, 
you know, it's like it's not going to give you a good result anyway. So we we try to improve that, and uh, we we got some good results out of it, and we are now have some stable clustering that is running in our Jenkins environment all the time. So so that that's a that's a you know one of the good improvement we did. Config reconciliation. So config reconciliation is something we got a feedback in the last uh, DDF or I think summit where people wanted to know that you know if the device get connected, disconnected, and somebody do something to device, they delete the bridge or interface or something, and they connect back, you know, then device don't come to the same state. It's like a config in a data store of the controller is not matching with the device configuration. So it like you know it's it's like an, it's not in the same state. So yeah, so that this was one of the you know important feedback we got and we worked on this. And now OVSDB Southbound plugin actually support the full reconciliation. So if your device goes down and it connects back, your device will have the same configuration that you have in uh, you know OVSDB config data store. So the whole configuration will be replicated on your device. Southbound plugin also we we did a partial reconciliation part uh, yeah, that is the connection reconciliation, but the bridge and the termination point configuration reconciliation is still kind of you know in in work in progress. We have patches for it, so hopefully we'll get its own in you know weeks or two weeks of a time. So after that you know both of these plugin will provide you a full you know um, reconciliation support. We migrated to data change listener. Uh, data change listener is basically is a performance improvement. So uh, previously we used to use a data change listener, and that was kind of you know had some performance uh, implications. And then clustering platform folks they implemented a data tree change listener is more performant. So we migrated the whole code to the data tree change listener. We did performance improvement. I'll talk a little bit about that auto attach table. I briefly will go through this. Uh, QS support is something which I think Eric already talked in his, uh, you know, talk. He was, you know, the OVSDB was one part of it. The so whole use case he was talking about it. OVSDB was one component there, and we needed some support for QS there. So Intel did that job, you know, to add the QS support. And the good thing is now we have a two plugin. And uh, OVSDB use the JSON RPC mechanism. So we have a single library uh, that is used by both the plugins. And that was not working in, in, in you know, when we introduced Harvard Vita because of some conflict and all that, because the same connection, but do, dif do two different kind of a schema can come to the controller. So we fixed some of that part in there. So library is now good. You can load parallel, you know, both the plugin in parallel, and you can use, you can connect your devices through a single library. We improve a single, you know, CSIT test. So we are running a single node and a clustered Jenkins all the time, you know, and they are green from last three and four weeks. So it's pretty stable as of now. So that's the that's the, so one of the you know biggest headache we had because that actually shows that you your how stable is your code. So if your Jenkins is failing all the way, you know. That's not giving a good confidence to you. So we, we work hard on that part, and now now it's, it's working pretty stable from last one month or so. We did a lot of uh, you know memory leak issue, thread leak issue, and those critical fixes, and that actually helped in the performance improvement also. So obvious uh, reconciliation part. So reconciliation is pretty simple. Uh, uh, your device, there is two way controller can connect to the device. One is controller can initiate the connection. Second thing is device can initiate a connection. Okay, and in both of the cases we need to do the reconciliation. But in the first case where device connect to the controller, where controller connect to the device, there is additional reconciliation that is required from required from a controller is because if the controller goes down, unless a device disconnected. Because controller initiated a connection, it's a responsibility of the controller to kind of you know reconcile that connection, okay, and go and try to attempt to you know connect to the device again. So we have you know some uh, you know connection re attempt mechanism there. So we kind of try to attempt the connection after every five seconds or so, and this is incremental. So it will make you know ten attempts or something, and that will end up you know it will it's like mostly five minutes. It will try to connect to the device. Okay, so if it is, if device is not there, is not able to connect it, it'll just give up. But these these configuration, you know, these timing interval is not configurable yet. But you know, we are planning to make it configurable in a carbon release, so you can you know set it the way. If you don't really want a connection reconciliation, you can just disable it as well. And and other configuration related to bridge and termination point uh, that will happen when the switch connects back. It will try to reconcile the whole configuration, and that works in the same way for you know controller initiated connection or the uh, switch initiated connections. 
so in this, uh, this is the much of an internal detail, so how plugin works. But for an application contract, is very simple, you know. If your device is gone, it come back up. Application can assume that whatever configuration I have in config data store is going to be replicated on a device. So that's a very simple, uh, you know, contract for application. So if you're developing application on top of OBSDB, you make sure that you don't really have to take any extra step to make sure that, you know, whether the configuration is there on the switch or not. Obviously, you know, we, we are lacking some of the, you know, uh, what you can say, error handling mechanism, where what if the reconciliation fails, right? We need to notify the application that reconciliation fail, and then you have to try again to kind of, you know, get to the same configuration. So that part is something which we are planning to improve in a carbon release. Uh, but yeah, we, we kind of tested the whole reconciliation scenarios uh, in, in Baron, and it, it worked, worked uh, pretty much, you know, uh, stable. Clustering support. So yeah, this was kind of, uh, uh, we did in uh, Beryllium. So I think we talked about it in uh, a DDF session also. So uh, at a high level, you know, what is what is the application contract here is because you are now running your OVSDB or three instances and you are connecting your device to three controllers, right? So so application need to know what is the contract for these device handling now in a clustered node. So the simple contract here is that, you know, as far as device is present in operational data store, application can configure it. That's, that's the simple line. If you see the device in your operational data store, you can write any type of configuration on that device and it, it plugin should take care of it. That's, that's the kind of contract we give to the application. Uh, and they can configure the device through any controller. You don't really have to go to any specific controller. You can fire your config request to any of the controller and it should work. Uh, and your device can connect to any of the controller. We don't put any restriction on whether the device can connect to one or a two or three node. You can connect to one or more nodes. If you connect to more, one, more than one node, your device have a high availability will be there. If, if your device disconnect from one controller, you still have a connectivity through a different controller to the same device, right? So it gives you a device such a here. Okay, so this is how, you know, very, very simplistic view of uh, how Southbound plugin looks. So you have MD cell data store, which is not really part of the OVSDB plugin, but you have a Southbound plugin and then library and that talk to a device. And plugin do all the notification and transact operation through the OVSDB library on the device. So this is how the single node looks. When you have a three node, this looks like this. You have a three instances, your device is connected to three controllers, and they all are talking to MD cell. Now, let's see everybody start doing the operation, then they will start stomping on each other. You know, if you create a bridge, they all will attempt to create a bridge on, you know, uh, OVSDB device. So it's like, Nothing will happen, obviously, we will say, okay, bridge already exists, nothing happened, right? But it's, it's unnecessary operation that they are doing on the device, and it's putting a load on the, you know, instance also. So now, how to sort it out? So you need someone who can tell who is the owner of this device, you know, who can configure this device. So somebody need to be there. And that's where the entity ownership clustering service come. This is a service that is implemented in, uh, you know, a clustering platform. And, and to, to give a gist of it, what it does, it, it, if you ask it that, you know, whether I am, can give me the ownership of the device, then it will select from the candidates, say, okay, these all folks are asking for a ownership, and you choose one of them, and you say, you, you notify that particular controller instance, saying you are now the owner of the device, and once the ownership is kind of, you know, notified to that particular controller instance, it will take control of the device. Okay, so that then then that that particular controller instance is going to be the owner of the device, and that's going to kind of configure the device. So you know that decision making is kind of you know uh, delegated to the controller uh, clustering platform, and uh, we use this extensively to kind of provide that clustering support. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we are planning to use in a carbon. That's one of the thought we have because you know there was a reason we implemented the singleton clustering that goes gives up some good you know things which we can leverage here, and that's something which is in our to-do list to kind of you know discuss through whether it makes sense to go that way or not. But most probably we probably will go there because we've seen good result using singleton clustering in other project like OpenFlow plugin. So yeah, that's that's in plan. But as of now, it's you know it's like cluster, singleton clustering is a wrapper around EOS, but we are directly using the EOS. So we, we probably will move there because it makes the code simpler. It's just, you know, OVSDB code is not complex for that matter for, you know, clustering. So that's the easy part. 
So yeah, it's just the animation I'll go through. So uh, once the device connect, you know, and everybody will, you know, go to entity ownership, ownership service and they'll ask, give me the ownership of the device, okay? And that ownership service will, you know, uh, send back a notification to all the nodes and they will say the three flags, it will send a three flags where it will say is owner, was owner or has owner, okay? So if is owner is true, it means that particular instance actually got the ownership of the device. Okay, so in this case, the second instance got is owner equal to true. It means it assumed that I am the owner of the device. Uh, it will register for a notification and callbacks and it will, it will be responsible for configuring this device. Rest of the two controller instances, they will just watch, you know, if something happens to this controller and the ownership changes, then they will act. Otherwise, they are kind of in a standby mode. But it does not really mean that they are standby for all the nodes. You know, you can connect other device to you know other OVS device to these three of controller and you know control one can be the owner of the device. So all these are uh, active controller and they can you know manage set of the devices here. They are not owned by you know it's like uh, they are not an owner of the device I would say. Has owner means you know no, so it's, it's asking about whether the device has an owner or not, right? So this uh, controller instance too got the ownership, ownership of it, right? This will be notified that you are not an owner, you was not an owner, but this device has an ownership. So, so don't just assume that I am the owner, right? If, if you are not explicitly notified. So if anybody else is the owner, the rest of the will, you know, instances will be notifying saying has owner is equal to false, has owner equal to true, it means somebody is owning this device. So don't do anything, sit quietly. So that will be notified by entity ownership service because that is at a platform layer. So if anything happens, if somebody deregister their candidature or the controller node goes down, you know, all those things is tracked by entity ownership service and it will notify you. We'll come back to that use case, you know. So, so this is what happens. Once the ownership is assigned, then you know your the second instance is going to be owner and is going to do all the operation for you. Now what happens, you know, the the scenario you were talking about, right? What if something happens, you know, owner, the owner goes down. So let's assume in this scenario that this controller three was the owner of it and somebody just kill minus nine and kill the Java process, right? So your Java process is going down. So once that, that particular node goes down because it's a part of the cluster, clustering service will, you know, figure out that one node is down. Then entity ownership service figure out, okay, one node is down, it means it's time to notify other nodes if, you know, they get the ownership of the device or not. So in this case, EOS will notify uh, to both of them. It will choose one of them you know, because there are two remaining component, you know, controller instances. They'll choose first, you know, controller second. It will say, okay, you are the owner of it, and the second one you are, is going to say you are not a owner, but you know, you you just you know because somebody else is already owning it. So controller two will uh, take a control of the device, and controller one will set you will do nothing. And then the same thing, you know, then OVSDB, the controller second instance will start, mon, you know, configuring the device. So this is the, this is the pretty much summary I was, you know, I uh, mentioned in the, these, through this animation. So the code operation, all the configuration will be done by the owner. And the change of owner will be notified by the EOS. And, and the whole code is kind of, you know, using the entity ownership service very extensively. So if there is a bug entity ownership service, there is a possibility that this cluster implementation will kind of break. But that we, we, we didn't see that. It's pretty much stable as of now. Because we are doing pretty extensive tests for, you know, various scenarios for the clustering and it's, it's pretty good now. So if you, uh, these were just, uh, you know, two scenarios, you know, connection, uh, device connection and the controller goes down, but there are a lot of other scenarios that, you know, we, we talked about in details. So you can go to this presentation, it has a nice animation about how things work internally into OVSDB clustering. So if anybody want to take a stab at OVSDB clustering, they can go through these slides and they can easily understand the code which we have in OVSDB. Performance improvement, so let me, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, so uh, what happens is this a little bit of internal detail. I don't want to go there, but let me quickly give you an answer. So, we use a clustered notification. So, if anybody write into any of the controller, that anyway will go through a leader, and leader is not necessarily is going to be the owner of the device, right? So, eventually that data will be committed into data store. Once that commit will happen, all the three instances will get the notification. But the only and inst controller will take, you know, uh, some action on this is the owner controller. So if, if he sees that this particular configuration is for this device, then it will check whether I'm the owner of the device or not. If he's owner of the device, it will take the action on the device. So that's how it's managed. So rest all will just skip it because they are not a owner of the device. So yeah, it's cluster data tree changes now, yeah. Uh, this is this is the pattern that come across uniform for all the southbound plugins, right? And that actually gives you uh, some motivation about writing the singleton clustering, right? Because everybody will have to write the same code now. So what you do, you offload it to singleton clustering. You just try to wrap up something and put there so application can easily use it. Because you know then there are a lot of issues come up when everybody writing and start using it and they start using same entity type and all that. It can create issues. So having a wrapper around that actually manages this is a good thing. You know, so that's why we, that's the one thought that we are thinking about moving toward, you know, using singleton clustering and OVSD, but that is something we need to discuss, but yeah, that's a plan, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can, you can do that, but you, then you have to put a restriction. Then you know your your device need to be connected to all the controller nodes. Okay, we don't want it to have that restriction. We we just want you know up to the user whether they want to connect it to one or two. If they connect to the one controller and that is not a shard leader, and it's not going to get notification, it won't. It's in a clustered mode, and if you if your device is connected to let's say controller one, and it's not you know shard leader where you are kind of writing your data, it's not going to get a notification, right? So yeah. 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 Then I think it's good, but that's a restriction, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and the sometimes what happens is internally in the plugin you maintain a little bit of caches, right? So whenever the switch happens, you have to maintain those caches. We try to reduce, you know, a lot of caches here because once you use the in-memory caches in a clustering environment, that's bad, you know. So yeah, but there is still some time you have to use it. So so that way we kind of think, you know, we don't really want to get application to a shard level understanding. You know, we just want them to, you know, learn that, okay, this is a device, I can configure it. We don't really want them to give any restriction about where to connect, what to connect, and the, you know, that will give you an implementation specific model, and we don't really want to go there. So we want to mask everything from the application up so that, you know, they can just assume my device is connected, I can configure it, and that's done, right? And at a southbound, we don't really want to restrict as well, because if you say, okay, you can connect to this or that, you have to, if, if you want them to kind of go and check the controller who is a shard leader and then connect it to it, that's not a good way to go about it. So we don't want to put any, it's very generic interfaces and contract which we want to implement here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see how OpenFlow plugin does. <laughs> if it does good, we probably will think it. <laughs> You know, so because we have a pretty stable code right now, so we, before moving that, we want to have some, you know, some, you know, lab rat to check what's happening. So if if open for plugin does good, which I'm monitoring anyways, then we probably will move to that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, okay, so we are running out of time. So just quickly, let's go through the performance part of it. So uh, this is one of the, you know think that came out at the end of the Baron release where, you know, Ericsson and other folks, they were internally testing it to kind of do get some performance out of it. And there were a lot of bottleneck was coming. So what we figured out is, you know, that, you know, for a few VM, if you create, OVSDB send you a lots of update. Okay. It's like you see the controller table and manager table, you get for a four VM, you get 2000 plus of the updates. These are the messages that is coming from a single OVS switch. Now, if you want to horizontally scale it, and with these kind of messages coming from OVS, it's, it's not scalable, right? So, oh wow. Well.
Yeah, so so it's, it's not scalable. The reason was because when we were registering for any device, we actually register for all the notification blindly. So we get all the notification and some of those notification are not necessary for OVS DB plugin to work. So some of the tables that is, you know, we we skip monitoring now. Some of the, you know, columns, uh, something we, we started skipping that and that significantly reduced this. So this version and the statistics, this is something we started skipping it. Because what happens is if even if you modify statistics in OVSDB, it will generate a new version ID. And these are the chains OVSDB will send it to you. Okay, so we started skipping these columns so that you know now now we don't get these much of uh, messages from the OVS device. So it actually reduced significantly. It's like eighty percent or something per device. Okay, and that is a kind of a big push when you kind of want to you know scale horizontally. We are trying to do some more improvement in terms of how we process the messaging in in the VSDB library and use some better approach to kind of you know throttle the messages and all that. That will you know hopefully come in a carbon release. So as of now, we've seen good number with it, and you know folks uh, downstream tested it and they got some good good number with that. Uh, auto test support is something which you know we added to kind of uh, add a support for SPB network is done by uh, InnoSype. Uh, if you want to get more details about these, you know you can go through a draft and all those things. But it's, it's not uh, it's, there's no extensive support. It's just that how you configure the auto test table. Uh, there is support is on the way for OVS also. So it's some of the you know pre work is already done here. So if anybody is interested in SFP, please you know contact me or you know Rashmi Puja from InnoSype. She actually worked on this use case, so you can get more details here. Okay, so I bragged about the OVS DB CSIT, so I put a link here, so if you guys want to look at what kind of test we are running, whether it's good enough or you want to provide any feedback, suggestion, please, you know, feel free to go to the CSIT link. And big, big thanks to Jamo from Red Hat, and he actually, you know, actively look at it and, you know, poked us whenever it broke. So we, we, it's because of him that, you know, now these, these tests are stable and we are pretty confident about what we are releasing. Uh, future direction. So, initial two points is you know is is very critical for a carbon release because now we are targeting the audience where who wants to use this in enterprise deployment. So performance and the documentation. Uh, performance because this obvious reason because people wanted to use and they want more performant southbound plugin. But documentation because one of the DDF in one of the DDF and SF you know these summit I got a feedback that you know you have a good code there which we can use but you know it's very hard to kind of know how to configure the plugin using RESTCon for any other interfaces. So that usability part is kind of, you know, hindering the usability of the OVSDB plugin itself. So we are planning to work on extensive documentation and tutorials so that people can easily use it and consume it. Uh, apart from the stability, is is anyway is is a constant thing on our mind to kind of you know make it stable, and that's where we are kind of focusing more on CSIT part of it. Uh, usability is, is obviously you know the part I already mentioned. Clear development process, so we want a clear you know new contributor onboarding system, which we are working and we will discuss in today's you know DDF session. So if you are interested in, please join the DDF session. We have a session you know planned, so you can. Click that link and you'll get it. So it's, it's said OVSDB carbon planning. Okay, so it's more information if you want to get involved. There's, there's nothing, you know, all the links which you can use to go and reach out to the folks where you can get more details and all that. Okay, so I think we are pretty out of time. So any any question, last minute question, or we can, you know, just talk offline outside. So who is next, by the way, for, to present here? Anybody waiting? Priscilla? Okay. Guys, come here. Okay, so I'll be here, you know. So just let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Or it like a full fledged OVSDB plugin, but that was there because they needed it for the whole, you know, bigger solution there. And it was all initially based on the AD cell, that is the old cell model we had. Uh, and then we migrated the whole code to the MD cell in a lithium uh, plugin time base uh, in a and after that, we introduced the OVSDB hardware VTAP Southbound plugin. That is the main use case is still an OpenStack uh, L2 gateway, uh, you know, service provision. Uh, that's the reason we kind of introduced OVSDB hardware VTAP. Uh, and now the entire code base is based on MD cell because AD cell is deprecated out of the controller. Uh, 
and yeah, obviously, we are network split is something we are going to talk. <laughs> now, thinking about the network because network was also kind of a functionality of the OBS DB. Uh, but now in, in a Boron release, we kind of, you know, split it out and it's now its own new project. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think this is, this works better. So we talk about the existing functionalities, clustering support, reconciliation support. Blueprint support and performance. So these are the feature that we, you know, apart from the existing functionality, we added three, these, you know, four major functionalities in in Beryllium release and the Boron release. We'll talk about it, you know. So now after they split, when the network functionality out of it, now the two major functionality that this project has is OVSDB southbound plugin and hardware VTAP southbound plugin. And they have a library that is basically encoding, decoding library, uh, you know, that is used by both of these plugins. So you can go to the wiki page. We have a details there. We are putting more documentation there. So hopefully that will help. Uh, if you want to look at the code base, you can go to this GitHub or a Garrett, this link. It has a OESDB master branch or all the branches, all the codes are there. Uh, in Beryllium and Boron release, we had around 30, 72 contributors. And... Uh, and we, we had, a hello everyone, my name is Anil and I'm PTL of OVSDB project and uh, I'll be today, you know, taking you through briefly about what we did in last two release, Beryllium and Boron and what we are, you know, planning for the, for the future carbon release. Uh, so I'll briefly go through the high level features of it. I won't be going deep down into it, but if you need more details, we'll provide you references where you can reach out to us, you know, to get more details about those things. So I'll go through a brief history of it and I'll talk about the uh, project overview, uh, OVSDB and a network split. So most of you, if you are following the OVSDB project, you must be briefly about the future direction, but we will be having a, you know, uh, another DDF session. We will be talking about more detail in a future direction part of it and some references to, you know, get, getting started with the OVSDB. So this project was proposed in hydrogen release by Kyle, Brent, and Madhu. And uh, scope for this project was initially to kind of support the, you know, OpenStack networking. So OpenStack Neutron networking, doing through ODL controller. So that was the initial scope. And that required, uh, you know, a few components into it because uh, they wanted to do is using OVS and OpenFlow. So you know, they implemented the, you know, a shim layer or, or a kind of a driver for OVSDB, uh, and that was that was not a full intent to kind of su 